This is Ling270, Language, Technology, and Society. In this module, we are examining modern language technology, including speech recognition and machine translation. In this lecture, we are going to take a very brief look at some of the techniques that have been used in recent decades and today in machine translation. From the 1950s onwards, there was a lot of research in machine translation. Throughout the 20th century, the dominant forms of research and systems in machine translation were rule-based. These systems, as seen in the Vaqua Triangle in a previous lecture, involved analysis, transfer, and generation. The analysis, transfer, and generation modules were typically constructed using handcrafted, linguistically motivated rules. Beginning in the late 1980s and early 1990s, a research group at IBM who was familiar with noisy channel approaches in statistical speech recognition attempted to use some of those same noisy channel approaches and statistical techniques in word-based machine translation. This is where we're going to pick up with results and techniques from that era, the late 1980s and early 1990s. We will then move on to phrase-based statistical machine translation, and finally, neural machine translation, which is the predominant paradigm as of 2020. Let's look at the idea of word-for-word -word translation, lexical translation. When we're trying to translate a word, such as the German word house, seen here in bold, there are numerous possible translations into English. House, building, home, household, or shell. Shell is a bit of a weird one, but in German, the house of a snail is its shell. Normally, though, we would use house or sometimes building. In this lecture, we're going to be using German as our foreign language and we'll be translating into English. I want to thank Philip Kern of Johns Hopkins University for the gracious use of these slides. Philip is the author of the Statistical Machine Translation Textbook and more recently, the Neural Machine Translation Textbook. If you're interested in following along, these slides can be found in extended form at statmt.org slash book. Let's say we wanted to train a machine translation system based on actual data. That was the big step forward in the late 1980s with that team at IBM. Rather than construct rules for translating by hand, Data would be the primary source of information. So this assumes that we have a parallel corpus. When we say a parallel corpus, what I mean by that is a text in the foreign language with a parallel text containing its English translation. So in general, a parallel corpus is going to have one version of a corpus in one language and a translation of that corpus in a different language. S 
specifically, I'm going to assume, in general, that we have a sentence-aligned parallel corpus. That means for each sentence in German, we know what sentence it is its English translation. And we're going to make the somewhat simplifying assumption that every sentence in German has exactly one English sentence as its translation. Let's imagine a corpus that looks that has statistics that look like this. So the German word Haus occurred 10,000 times in our sample corpus. Of those 10,000 times, when we examine the German sentence and then look at its respective English translation, the German word Haus was, in this sample corpus, translated as the English word house 8,000 times. So this is by far the most common usage, the most common translation. 8 out of 10 times the German word house was translated as the English word house. 1,600 times the German word house was translated as the English word building. 200 of those 10,000 times, the German word house was translated by the translator into English as home. 150 times, it was translated as household, and 50 times, it was translated as shell. Now, in a corpus of 10,000 example, uh, uh, 10, examples of the German word house, it's actually a bit surprising that there were as many as 50 examples of shell. Presumably, at some portion in that corpus, the document is talking extensively about snails. Now, the first important step that we're going to take after collecting co-occurrences, so for each German word, the number of times each English word translated as that in the corpus, we're going to use a technique called relative frequency estimation to convert these counts into probabilities. So we're going to take each count and divide that count by the total number of occurrences of the German word. So if we add up the counts in this table, they add up to 10,000. So to get the probability of house, given the German word house, we're going to take 8,000 divided by 10,000, giving us 0 0.8. 1,600 divided by 10,000 gives us 0 0.16, or 16%. Two hundred divided by two thousand gives us zero point zero two. One hundred and fifty divided by ten thousand gives us zero point zero one five, so one and a half percent. And finally, fifty divided by ten thousand gives us zero point zero zero five, or half a percent. These probabilities, importantly, add up to one. So the question arises, how did we know that the German word house in a particular parallel sentence translated as into the English word house? Well, if you're a bilingual German-English speaker, then you can simply look at the two sentences and know, based on your knowledge of how English and German relate to each other, what translated as what. For example, I know enough German to be able to look at this parallel sentence 
and draw these bold lines. So I know based on my experience and knowledge of German that das in this context translates as the, that Haus in this context translates as house, that ist in this context translates as is, and that klein in this context translates as small. This is called a word alignment, where we take the two sentences that are parallel with each other and align the word positions from each sentence. Now notice here we're using one-based word indexing and numbering the positions in both the German side and on the English side. Now we can formalize this as a function. So the function is going to take an English target word position as the argument to the function and return the corresponding German word index position that the English word at position I aligns to. So in the example that we saw on the previous page, this is a very simple alignment function. One aligns to one, two aligns to two, three aligns to three, and four aligns to four. Keep in mind, the arrow, the, the one on the left-hand side of the arrow is the English word position. The number on the right-hand side of the arrow is the German word position. Word order is not always the same in any given two languages. So even though we can translate this English sentence into the German sentence, das Haus ist klein, which is what we saw a couple of slides ago, it's also possible that the German word order and the English word order could be mixed up. So it's perfectly reasonable in German to say klein ist das Haus, literally meaning small is the house. But if we were translating it into fluent English, we would almost certainly say the house is small. So here, we also have an alignment function. So we see that one is aligned to three, meaning the word at English position one, which is the, aligns with the German word at position three, meaning das. The English word at position two, Haus, is aligned to the German word at position four, Haus. The English word at position three, is, is aligned to the German word at position two, ist. And finally, the English word at position four, small, is aligned to the German word at position one. It's also possible that there is not a one-to-one -one alignment between source and target words. Here is an example where we have an English sentence where two words in the English correspond to a single word in the German. So here the German is das Haus ist klitzekein and the English is the house is very small. Here we see that the English word at position four very, aligns with the German word at position four, klitzeklein. And it's also the case that the English word at position five also aligns to the German word at position four, klitzeklein. It's also possible that we could have words dropped in translation. So in this case, it wouldn't be a great English translation to translate das Haus ist klein as house is small, because in English, we really ought to have the there to correspond with the das. But there are other situations where this is perfectly legitimate. And in that case, we simply have no English word aligned with the German word at position one.
It's also possible that there's words on the English side that have no correspondence on the German side. So if we have the German sentence, das Haus ist klein, one possible English translation is the house is just small. Now, in this case, the word at English position four, just, doesn't align to any German word. So we're going to insert kind of an imaginary word called null that's just a placeholder at what we'll call position zero. This allows us to still have a well-defined well alignment function where the English word at position four aligns with the German position zero. So this word alignment can actually be learned automatically from data. So if we've got a large corpus of sentence aligned translations, so a parallel corpus aligned at the sentence level, then it's possible to automatically learn word alignments. We're not going to go into the technical details of that now, but if you're interested, I encourage you to take one of our classes on machine translation, where we'll go into that in much more detail. So these word alignments and the probabilities associated with them form the core of what's called statistical word-based machine translation. In statistical word-based machine translation, the words are the core atomic units. But this has some disadvantages. So if we go back to this example, we've got a one-to-many translation. So Klein really translates as very small. If we're doing a simple word-based model, it's not obvious how we can elegantly ha handle this one-to-many translation. Many-to-one translations are also problematic. One way of getting beyond word-based models is to instead translate chunks or contiguous so-called phrases. And these phrases serve as the atomic units of translation. Now, by phrases, I want to make the important distinction that I'm not necessarily referring to constituent phrases as you are familiar with from linguistics. Indeed, early phrase-based models attempted to restrict phrases to linguistic constituent phrases, and often the result was poorer performance. Based on that early finding, statistical phrase-based models going forward loosened the restriction and allowed any contiguous chunk to serve as a phrase. Phrase-based models have, have certain advantages over word-based models, and the performance of phrase-based models was far better than the earlier word-based models. Phrase-based models can easily handle one-to-many, many-to-one, and many-to-many -many translations, including non-compositional phrases. These phrases have the advantage of implicitly containing the local context, the context within the phrase, in the translation. And as corpus sizes increase, longer phrases can in practice be used. Statistical phrase-based machine translation became the standard de facto model that was used by Google Translate and many academic and commercial researchers up until the mid-2010s. Let's take a look at the phrase-based model. 
So in a phrase-based model, we'll start with the foreign language sentence, which in this case is Natürlich hat John Spaß am Spiel, which we want to translate into the English sentence, of course, John has fun with the game. The foreign language sentence is first segmented into chunks, which again, we're calling phrases. Note that Spaß am is not necessarily a constituent phrase. Each of these chunks, these phrases, are then translated into English using a translation table that has been learned from data. And finally, the phrases can potentially be reordered. Notice here that we have some reordering. In the German sentence, the second word is hot, whereas in the English sentence, the translation of hot is at a position further out, at the third position. The probabilities associated with the phrase translation table come from data and indeed, in practice, are built upon word alignments that are learned from data. Here we see different translations of the German natürlich as of course, naturally, of course, comma, or comma, of course, comma. This brings up an interesting point. In practice, machine translation involving text usually includes punctuation marks as normal tokens in the text. So punctuation marks are treated the same way as other words. This may seem like an odd thing to do, but in practice, it tends to work quite well. Here's a bit of an extended phrase table. Here we have another phrase, den Vorschlag. This is an actual phrase in German from an actual parallel corpus. The parallel corpus is the Europarl corpus. The Europarl corpus is a corpus of parliamentary proceedings from the European Union Parliament. This corpus is available in a large number of languages of Europe. So notice here that we've got Den Vorschlag, the German, and quite a variety of lexical variation. Sometimes we've got proposals, sometimes we've got suggestions, sometimes we've got the motion. There's morphological variation, so proposal versus proposals. Sometimes we have the, sometimes we have a, sometimes we don't. And sometimes there's noise. So notice here that we have it. Now, it isn't necessarily a wrong translation, but it's not a very precise translation. So den Vorschlag is referring to a proposal or specifically the proposal. And you could translate the proposal as it, but usually that's not gonna be a very helpful translation. So, as I mentioned before, this model is not limited to linguistic phrases. So a linguistic constituent phrase would be something like a noun phrase or a verb phrase or a prepositional phrase. We see here in the center of this slide in blue, Spaß am, translating as fun with the. Now, this is actually a perfectly fine translation. Spaß am really does translate as fun with the. But in most linguistic theories, this wouldn't be considered a constituent phrase. But in practice, limiting the phrase table to linguistic phrases only, linguistic constituent phrases only, has typically been shown to hurt quality. The probability model involved in statistical phrase-based machine translation 
can involve multiple probabilistic components. The most important two components are a translation model that contains the conditional probability of an English phrase given a foreign phrase, and the language model probability, which gives the prior probability of an English language phrase or sentence. This can also be decomposed further to allow more, uh, more models, including a distortion or reordering probability model. The phrase translation table used in statistical phrase-based machine translation is learned automatically from a parallel corpus without manual intervention. The three primary steps in learning a phrase-based translation table are performing word alignment. So given a sentence aligned parallel corpus, the IBM word alignment models or some similar word alignment model is applied to perform word alignment. Once word alignment is obtained, phrase pairs are extracted according to what is allowed by the word alignments. And finally, each extracted phrase pair is associated with two or more probability scores matching with the probability scores in being used. For example, the translation model score, the language model score, and so on. Earlier, we saw word alignment visualized as a horizontal list of words with another horizontal list of words below them connected by slanted or straight vertical lines. This is an alternative way that we see here of visualizing a word alignment sentence pair. So here, the dark filled in square indicates alignment. So here, the name Michael is aligned with Michael. Assumes is aligned with Geht davon aus. The comma on the German side is not aligned to anything on the English side. That and das are aligned. He and er are aligned. Will stay is aligned to bleibt. In the is aligned to im and house is aligned to house. Now, based on this alignment, we can extract the phrase pairs that will then go in the phrase table. So each of these rectangular regions defines a phrase pair. Some of them are squares, meaning it's a one word to one word translation. Some of them are rectangles, meaning it's longer. Here is an example of a phrase pair that goes beyond even a single black rectangle. So we can take and make a larger unit out of two of these phrase pairs. So the larger unit here is geht davon aus, comma, das. On the English side, assumes that. So we say that this phrase pair is consistent with this word alignment. Once we have a phrase table and a language model, we can perform decoding. So decoding is the term in statistical machine translation for actually applying the translation model. So actually performing the translation. Now, in decoding, the computer program performing the machine translation will attempt to find the translation with the highest probability according to the translation and language model. Now, it's possible that this most probable translation is not a good translation. 
This indicates that the model should be updated and fixed. It's also possible that the search process, the computer program attempting to find this highest probability translation, fails to find the most probable translation, in which case you need to fix the search process. Let's walk through briefly the process of translating this German sentence into English using a statistical phrase table. The German sentence is Er geht ja nicht nach Hause. First, we'll arbitrarily choose one of the German words or phrases to translate first. Here, we're choosing er and translating er as he. In order to do this, there must be a phrase pair in the phrase table that says that er can translate as he. Next, we'll choose ja nicht. As I said, we don't have to choose in order. We can pick out of order. So in the phrase table, ja nicht has multiple phrase pairs, one of which is does not. Next, we will choose gate and translate gate as go by looking in the phrase table and finding the translation go for gate. And finally, nach Hause translates as home. It's okay if you don't understand all of the formulas shown here. The important part that I'm trying to show you is that in performing translation, in performing decoding, translation probabilities are applied. And those translation probabilities include multiple components. The phrase translation and the language translation, language model translation scores, as well as most likely a reordering score. Later statistical machine translation systems involved many more uh, models in addition to these three. Now, the example that I showed you just a couple slides back was only one of many possible translations for this German sentence. In practice, when trained on real data on Europarl, the proceedings of the European Union Parliament, the German and English parallel corpus, here are some of the phrase pairs that we found for the phrases in this sentence. Er could translate as he, it, comma it, comma he. Gate could translate as is, are, goes, go. Ja could translate as yes, is, comma of course, or simply comma. Nicht could translate as not, do not, does not, is not. Nach could translate as after, to, according to, in. House could translate as house, home, chamber, at home. And then longer phrases have translations as well. So er gate has multiple translations, including he goes. Gate ja has translations, including is after all. Ja nicht has translations, including does not. Nicht nach has translations, including not after. And nach Hause has translations, including under house. We are also showing one of the three word phrases here. Geht ja nicht has translations, including is not a. The phrase, the, the uh, translation that we actually want is the one highlighted here. He, go, does not, home, but not in that order. We, we will want it to, to be, he does not go home. So the search process, the decoding, has to 
make these decisions and calculate the probabilities of each of these phrase pairs along with the ones not highlighted. And if we have a good model, the probability, the, the translation that we want will ultimately be the one found by the search process to have the highest probability. Let's walk through this process partially. So to start, the decoder doesn't have any partial translations built. That's what this empty box represents. Next, we'll choose one of the possible phrase pairs, translating gate as R. There are also other translations of gate that we will also, that we'll include, and we'll keep track of which source words have been translated. The dark box that you see in each cell represents which source word or words have been translated so far. And then we'll continue expanding each of these nodes with other possible partial translations. Now, unfortunately, this search space, this space of all possible expansions, is in most instances too large to practically expand out fully. As a result, pruning takes place, meaning some options are simply not considered. It's possible that this pruning can create errors. Finally, at the end of the process, the nodes on the far right side have all of the words of the source language translated. The decoder then looks at all of the words, all of the nodes in the rightmost column, identifies the one with the highest probability, and then does a backtrace through this lattice to read off the translation resulting in he does not go home. So far, we looked at statistical word-based machine translation, which was introduced in 1988 and was prevalent in the 1990s. We next looked at statistical phrase-based machine translation which built on word-based models, but allows chunks as translations. Statistical word-based machine translation was dominant from the early to mid 2000s through the mid 2010s. Since the mid 2010s, the dominant models have involved neural networks. I'm now going to very briefly go through the and show you a neural network for a language model and then a neural network that can actually perform machine translation. We've seen before that a language model's job is to predict the next word in a sequence or alternatively to come up with a probability for a sequence. So here, we're using this bracketed S to indicate the start of a sentence. This is a visualization of a recurrent neural network acting as a language model. There's an embedding layer, which is used to transform the symbolic representation of a word into a vector of floating point numbers. This vector of floating point numbers is then provided as the input to a, rec a recurrent neural network, which ultimately will predict, using a softmax function, the most likely next word. Here is an expanded example showing the entire prediction of a sentence from beginning of sentence 
to end of sentence. So the model after beginning of sentence predicts the. After the, the model predicts house. Given house, the model predicts is. Given is, the model predicts big. Given big, the model predicts period. And given period, the model predicts end of sentence. Now, if we have a model like this, you could imagine asking the question, well, instead of predicting the next English word in this sequence, could we predict the translation of the English word? And it turns out the answer is yes. So a recurrent neural translation model will also predict the translations. Here is one of the earliest models that attempted to do this. This is an encoder-decoder model that was proposed by Google in 2014. This is a very simple model, but in some cases it actually worked. It's kind of amazing that it worked because it began by predicting the English sentence, word but word at a time, and then after the end of sentence, it then would sequentially predict the German translations of that English sentence. So given the house is big, it would then predict das Haus ist groß. Now, this model has something critically missing that we had going as far back as the statistical word-based machine translation models, as well as the phrase-based machine translation models, and that is an alignment mechanism. So modern neural machine translation, as of 2020, uses what's called attention, which is closely related to the idea of alignment. So the idea here is that we'll run an encoder, a recurrent neural network, to get an encoding of the source sentence as a sequence of vectorial representations. The vectorial representations here, we're going to summarize at, in green as the, the states that we get from the recurrent neural network, the RNN. So from a sentence, we have this sequence of RNN states where each green rectangle represents a vector, one per word in the source sentence. Now, in, there's no reason we couldn't do this in reverse. So rather than feeding the RNN the beginning of sentence and then waiting until we got end of sentence to say we're done, we could start at the end of sentence and go backwards to predict the beginning of sentence. And if we do that, we also end up with this sequence of hidden recurrent neural network RNN states that we see on the bottom of the slide going backward from the beginning of the sentence, or excuse me, from the end of the sentence to the beginning. These can then be coupled together, and at every point in translation, we can ask a separate model, which we'll call the attention model, given that I'm trying to translate the, which RNN hidden states are most relevant to predicting the German translation of the English word the. Or if we're translating the English word big, we could ask which of these RNN states are most relevant to producing the German translation of the English word big. Now, it's probably going to be the case that the RNN states directly above the embedding for big, the forward and backward RNN states associated with big, will be most relevant. But other words may also be partially relevant. 
The decoder then is responsible for doing the actual prediction. So the decoder is also a recurrent neural network that will take the attended summary of the hidden states, the green rectangles that we see here, and predict the next most likely German word. So the attention model will look at all of the hidden states from the encoder relating to the source sentence and determine which of these are most relevant given that I'm about to predict a particular German word. Here's what the model looks like if we break everything out and look at the entire translation of the house is big into das Haus ist groß. That's as far as we're going to go here. If you're interested in the technical details, again, I would strongly encourage you to sign up, sign up for one of our machine translation classes here at the University of Illinois. Thank you, and good luck with the rest of the semester.